Welcome to Being in the Way, the Alan Watts podcast, and I'm your host, Mark Watts. And today we're going to be listening to a great seminar. It's called Inevitable Ecstasy. It was recorded in 1969, one of a series of seminars that he did that year on the ferry boat Vallejo. He used to say of these recordings that I shouldn't be so careful to keep everything quiet because when anybody listened to a tape recording, they were going to be listening with babies crying and dogs barking and cars driving by. And this one in particular made me think of that because you hear a crackling fire keeping the place warm and also the bong on the old gas heater that warmed the ferry. I left them both in because they contribute to the character and particularly the bongs of the sheet metal. They seem to coincide with what he's saying almost in dialogue. So here's Alan Watts in session one of Inevitable Ecstasy. And that's going to be followed by an excerpt from session three. The entire seminar is four sessions long, and it's available through the Alan Watts Organization website, along with hundreds of talks. Today's podcast comes to you courtesy of the Ramdas Be Here Now podcast network. Our theme music is by Zakir Hussein, courtesy of Moment Records. And additional support has come from Eaton Hemp, whose products of munchable goodies and tinctures keeps everybody mellow and in the groove as we make these shows. And now here's Alan Watts in Inevitable Ecstasy. This seminar called Inevitable Ecstasy is about a very sticky problem, which is to say the problem to which the Buddha primarily addressed himself, which is that of agony, suffering. But before we get into that, we have to be clear about certain basics. And these basics have to do not so much with concepts and ideas as they do with the state of mind, the state of sensation, the state of consciousness, and We need to understand that, even be in that, before we can really go very far. And this is an extraordinarily difficult state of mind to talk about, even though in its nature it's extremely simple. Because it is in a way like we were when we were babies, when we hadn't been told anything and didn't know anything other than what we felt, and we had no names for it. Now, of course, as we grow older, we learn to differentiate one thing from another, one event from another, and above all, ourselves from everything else. Well and good, provided you don't lose the foundations. Just as mountains are differentiated, but they're all based on the earth, so the multiple things of this world are differentiated. But they have, as it were, a basis. There is no word for that basis, not really, because words are only for distinction. And so there can't really be a word, not even an idea, of the non-distinction. We can feel it, but we can't think it but we don't feel it like an object. You feel you're alive, you feel you're conscious, but you don't know what consciousness is because consciousness is present in every conceivable kind of experience. It's like the space in which we live, which is everywhere. It's like a fish being in water, and presumably a fish doesn't know it's in the water because it never goes out. A bird presumably knows nothing of the air, and we really know nothing of consciousness, and we pretend space isn't there. (laughs) So, however, when you grow up and become fascinated, which is really the right word, spellbound, enchanted, by all the things that adults wave at you, you forget the background. And you come to think that all the distinctions which you've been learning 
are the supremely important things to be concerned with. You become hypnotized. And so when we are told to pay attention to what matters, we get stuck with it, and that's what in Buddhism is called attachment. Attachment doesn't mean that you enjoy your dinner, you enjoy sleeping or beauty. Those are responses of our organism in its environment as natural as feeling hot near a fire or cold near ice. So are certain responses of fear or of sorrow. They are not attachment. Attachment is exactly translated by the modern slang term hang up. It's a kind of stickiness or what in psychology would be called blocking when you are in a state of wobbly hesitation, not knowing how to flow on. That's attachment, what is meant by the Sanskrit word klesha. So we get a hang up on all the various things that we are told as we grow up by our parents, our aunts and uncles, our teachers, by our peer group. And the first thing that everybody wants to tell us is the difference between ourselves and the rest of the world and between those actions which are voluntary and those which are involuntary what we do on the one hand and what happens to us on the other and this is of course immensely confusing to a small child because it's told to do all sorts of things that are really supposed to happen like going to sleep like having bowel movements, like uh, loving people, like not blushing, stopping being anxious, and all sorts of things like that. So what happens is this. The child is told in some that we, your parents, elders and betters, command you to do what will please us only if you do it spontaneously. <laughs> and no wonder everybody's completely confused. We go through life with that burden on us. We therefore develop this curious thing. We, we, we develop a thing which is called an ego. Now I've got to be very clear to you what I mean by an ego. An ego is not the same thing as a particular living organism. Uh, for my philosophy, the particular living organism, which is inseparable from a particular environment, that is to say from the universe as centered here and now, there's something real. It isn't a thing. I call it a feature of the universe. But what we call our ego is something abstract which is to say it has the same order and kind of reality as an hour or an inch or a pound or a line of longitude it is for purposes of discussion it is for convenience in other words it is a social convention that we have what is called an ego. But the fallacy that all of us make is that we treat it as if it were a physical organ, as if it were real in that sense, when in fact it is composed on the one hand of our image of ourselves, that is our idea of ourselves, as when we say to somebody, you must improve your image. Now, this image of ourselves is obviously not ourselves any more than an idea of a tree is a tree, any more than you can get wet in the word water. And to go on with, our image of ourselves is extremely inaccurate and incomplete. Would that some God, the gifted, gives to see ourselves as others see us. We don't. 
So my image of me is not at all your image of me. And my image of me is extremely incomplete in that it does not include any information to speak of about the functioning of my nervous system, my circulation, my metabolism, my subtle relationships with the entire surrounding human and non-human universe. So the image I have of myself is a caricature. It is arrived at through mainly my interaction with other people who tell me who I am in various ways, either directly or indirectly, and I play about with what their picture is of me and they play something back to me so that we set up this conception. And this started very, very early in life. And I was told, you see, and you were told, that we must have a consistent image. You must be you. You have to find your identity in terms of image. And this is an awful red herring. A lot of the current quest for identity among younger people is a search for an acceptable image. What role can I play? Who am I in the sense of what am I going to do in life? And so on. Now, while that has a certain importance, if it's not backed up by deeper matters, it's extraordinarily misleading. So therefore, on the one hand, there is this image, which is intellectual, emotional, imaginative, and so forth. Now, we would say, I don't feel that I am only an image. I feel there's something more real than that because I feel, I mean, I have a sense of there being a particular sort of, how do we say, a center of something, some sort of sensitive core inside the skin. And that corresponds to the word I. Let's take a look at this. Because the thing that we feel as being myself is certainly not the whole body. Because a lot of the body can be seen as an object. In other words, if you stand, stretch yourself out, lie on the floor and turn your head and look at yourself, you know, you can see your feet and your legs and all this up to here, and finally it all vanishes, only there's a sort of a vague nose in front. And you assume you have a head because everybody else does, and you've looked in a mirror, and that told you you had a head, but you could never see it, just like you can't see your back. So you tend to put your ego on the side of the unseen part of the body, the part you can't get at because that seems to be where it all comes from, and you feel it. But what is it that we feel? Because if I see clearly, and my eyes are in functioning order, the eyes certainly are not conscious of themselves. There are no spots in front of them, no defects, in other words, in the lens or in the retina or in the optic nerves that give hallucinations. So also, therefore, if my ego, my consciousness is working properly, I ought not to be aware of it as something sort of there, being a nuisance in a way in the middle of things because your ego is awfully hard to take care of. <laughs> well, what is it then that we feel? Well, I think I've discovered what it is. <laughs> it's a chronic, habitual sense of muscular strain, which we were taught in the whole process of doing spontaneous things to order. When you're taking off in a jet plane and the thing has gone rather further down the runway than you think it should have without getting up in the air, you start pulling at your seatbelt, get this thing off the ground. Perfectly useless. So in the same way, when our community tells us, look carefully, now listen, 
pay attention. We start using muscular strains around our eyes, ears, jaws, hands, to try to use our muscles to make our nerves work, which is, of course, futile. And in fact, it gets in the way of the functioning of the nerves. Try to concentrate. And then when we try to control our emotions, we hold our breath, pull our stomachs in, or tighten our rectal muscles to hold ourselves together. Now, pull yourself together! Uh, immediately, what are you to do? What does a child understand by that? He does it muscularly, pulls himself together. This is useless. So everybody chronically pulls themselves together so that it's so funny, if you get a person to just lie on the floor and relax, but there's the floor under you as firm as can be holding you up. Nevertheless, you will detect that the person is making all sorts of tensions. <laughs> <laughs> so that chronic tension, which in Sanskrit is called sankocha, which means contraction, is the root of what we call the feeling of the ego. So that in other words, this feeling of tightness is the physical referent for the psychological image of ourselves. So that we get the ego as the marriage of an illusion to a futility. Even though the idea of an I with a name, with a being, is naturally useful for social communication. Provided we know what we're doing and take it for what it is. But we are so hung up on this concept that it confuses us even in the proposition that it might be possible for us to feel otherwise. Because we ask the question, if we hear about people who have uh, transcended the ego, well, we ask, how do you do that? Well, I say, what do you mean? You, how do you do that? because the you you're talking about doesn't exist. So you can't do anything about it. Any more than you can cut a cheese with a line of longitude. <laughs> now that sounds very discouraging, doesn't it? But let's suppose now you are babies again and you don't know anything. Now, don't be frightened, because anything you know, you can get back later. But for the time being, here is our awareness. And let's suppose you have no information about this at all and no words for it. And that my talking to you is just a noise. Now, don't try to do anything about this. Don't make any effort. Because naturally, by force of habit, certain tensions remain inside you, and certain ideas and words drift all the time through your mind. Just like um, the wind blows or clouds move across the sky. Don't bother with them at all. Don't try to get rid of them. Just be aware of what's going on in your head like it was clouds in the sky or the crackling of the fire. There's no problem to this. All you have to do, really, is look and listen without naming, and if you are naming, never mind. Just listen to that.
Now, that you can't force anything here, that you can't willfully stop thinking and stop naming, is only telling you that the separate you doesn't exist. It isn't a mark of defeat. It isn't a sign of your lack of practice in meditation. That it runs on all by itself simply means that the individual separate you is a figment of your imagination. So you are aware at this point of a happening. Remember, you don't know anything about the difference between you and it. You haven't been told that. You've no words for the difference between inside and outside, between here and there. And nobody has taught you that what you see out in front of you is either near or far from your eyes. Watch a baby put out a finger to touch the moon. You don't know about that. Just, therefore, here it is. We'll just call it this. And if you will feel it, the going on, which includes absolutely everything you feel, and it's a happening. It doesn't happen to you, because where is that? You, what you call you, is part of the happening, <laughs> or an aspect of it. it. Has no parts. It's not like a machine. And it's a little scary because you'd say, "Well, who's in control around here? Why should there be anyone?" Now that's an, a very weird notion we have that processes require something outside them to control them. It never occurred to us that processes could be self-controlling. Even though we say to someone, control yourself. We can always, <laughs> in order to think about self-control, we split a person in two. So that there's a you separate from the self that's supposed to be controlled. Well, how can that achieve anything? How can a noun start a verb? Yet it's a fundamental superstition that that can be done. So you have this process, which is quite spontaneous, going on. We call it life. It's controlling itself. It's aware of itself. It's aware of itself through you. You are an aperture through which the universe looks at itself. And because of it's the universe looking at itself through you, there's always an aspect of itself that it can't see. So it is like that snake, you see, that is pursuing its tail. Because the snake can't see its head, like you can't. So therefore, we always find as we investigate the universe, make the microscope bigger and bigger and bigger, and we will find ever more minute things. Make the telescope bigger and bigger and bigger, and the universe expands because it's running away from itself. It won't do that if you don't chase it. <laughs> so, 
the universe is chasing its own tail, you see? It's, it's, it's the thing we're talking about, this Tao. And uh, it's a game of hide and seek. Really, when you ask the question, who is doing the chasing, you are still working under the assumption that every verb has to have a subject. That when there is an action, there has to be a doer. Well, that's a, what I will call a grammatical convention leading to what Whitehead called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Like the famous it in It Is Rainy. So when you say, there cannot be knowing without a knower, this is merely saying, no more than there can't be a verb without a subject. And that's a grammatical rule and not a law of nature. Anything you can think of as a thing, as a noun, can be described by a verb. And there are languages which do that. It sounds awkward in English, but face it, when you look for doers as distinct from deeds, you can't find them. Just as when you look for stuff underlying the patterns of nature, you can't find any stuff, you just find more and more patterns. There never was any stuff. It's a ghost. What we call stuff is simply patterns seen out of focus. And it's fuzzy. So we call it stuff. <laughs> you know, like that K-pop. <laughs> so, we, you know, we have these words, energy, matter, being, reality, even Tao. And we can never find them. They always elude us entirely. Although we do have the very strong intuition that all this that we see is connected or related. So we speak of a universe. Although that word really means one term. It's your turn now. <laughs> <laughs> or like you make one turn to look at yourself. But you can't make two turns and see what's looking. <laughs> So, it's very simple, therefore. You only have to understand that you can't do anything about it. You can struggle and struggle and struggle, and indeed will do so, as long as you have the feeling inside you that you're missing something. And, of course, if you are learning any sort of skill and you haven't perfected the skill, there is indeed something you're missing. But in this thing that we're talking about, that isn't true. Because you, as the Buddhists say, are Buddhas from the very beginning. And all that searching is like looking for your own head which you can't see and therefore might conceivably imagine that you're lost. So, that indeed is the point. That we don't see what looks and therefore we think we've lost it. And so we're in search of the self, the Atman. Well, that's the one thing we can't find. <laughs> because we have it. We are it. <laughs> but we confuse it with all these images. So therefore, if you understand perfectly clearly that you can't do anything to find that very, very important thing, God, enlightenment, nirvana, whatever, then what?
Well, I find, you know, it's so stupid because even if I tell myself, well, there's nothing I can do about it. Why did I say that? You see, why did I say that? Why did I go out of my way to tell myself there's nothing I can do about it? Because in the back of my mind, there was a funny little feeling that if I did tell myself that, something different would happen. See? All right. So even that doesn't work. Nothing works. Now, when absolutely nothing works, where are you? Well, here we are. I mean, you know, there's this feeling of something going on. Now, the world doesn't stop dead when there's nothing you can do. Here's something happening. Now, just there, that's what I'm talking about. There's the happening. When you are not doing anything about it, you're not not doing anything about it, you just can't help it, it goes on despite anything you think or worry about or whatever. Now, there is the point, right there. And remember, although you will think at first that this is a kind of determinism, there are two reasons why it isn't. One, there is nobody being determined. Now, other people think of determinism as the direction of what happens by the past, the causation of what happens by the past. Now, if you will use your senses, you will see that that is a hallucination. The present does not come from the past. If you listen, and only listen, close your eyes, where do the sounds come from according to your ears? You hear them coming out of silence. The sounds come and then they fade off. They go like echoes or echoes in the labyrinths of your brain which we call memories. The sounds don't come from the past. They come out of now and trail off. And that, that is recollected is the trailing off echo like the wake of a ship. And so just as the wake doesn't move the ship, the past does not move the present, unless you insist that it does. And if you say, well, naturally, I'm always moved by the past, that's an alibi. <laughs> and it completely fails to explain how you ever learn anything new. <laughs> that's why all the psychologists who are mostly behaviorists are completely bogged down in trying to find a theory of learning. Because according to the, the theory of learning that we have, everything that new that you assimilate is really only learned when translated into terms of what you already know. So in that sense, learning becomes like a library which increases only by the addition of books about books already in it. <laughs> a lot of libraries are indeed like that. So, that's what we call scholasticism. So then, you become aware that this happening isn't happening to you because you are the happening. The only you there is, is what's going on. Yeah, feel it. And disregard these stupid distinctions that you've been taught. I mean, stupid, relatively speaking and feel it genuinely. When you feel it genuinely and you get down to rock bottom, all that isn't there. That's a game that's been erected on it. And it isn't determined. In other words, you get this odd feeling of a synthesis between doing and happening, in which doing is as much happening as happening, and happening is as much doing as doing. And if you are not very careful at that point, you'll proclaim yourself God Almighty in the Hebrew Christian sense. 
like Freud alleges, babies feel that they're omnipotent. And in a way they are. I am omnipotent insofar as I'm the universe. But I'm not omnipotent in the role of Alan Watts. Only cunning. <laughs> <laughs> So now then, this sensation of the happening is basic to all we want to explore. It's there as you see you can't do anything. And that as you see you can't do anything, you don't go and distract yourself with something else. Any sort of distraction. Because if you do that, you will miss what follows from the feeling of what is going on when you're not doing anything. When you're not able even to not do anything. See, this is a sticky place. You can't get in and you can't get out. That's why it's called in Zen the mosquito biting the iron bull. Or the man who swallowed the ball of red hot iron, which he can't gulp down and can't spit out. See, it's that difficult. What are you to do or not do? And that tells you, you see, that dilemma. That what you thought was you just isn't there at all. Now, don't make it difficult, because that's a form of evading it. Don't make it easy. That's a form of evading it. It's neither difficult nor easy, because if it were difficult, it would have to be difficult for someone. If it were easy, it would have to be easy for someone. And the someone we're talking about is just the one that isn't there. And if you think it is there, okay, it's a free country. You can have that thought, but it's a thought. In other words, your ego is a thought among thoughts. It is not, in fact, the controlling thinker or the feeler or the sensor. It's one of them. And so, therefore, this thing is going along. And as I say, we get anxious because we feel nobody's in control, but nobody ever was. You know, when you've lived thus far a reasonably orderly life, I mean, there have been some catastrophes and uh, messes, but it's amazing how we have got this far. I mean, the thing looks after itself. And you will well remember that a lot of times that when you thought you were in charge and doing something sensible, you did something extremely foolish. And when you thought you did something extremely foolish, it turned out to be a blessing. Well, that's the way things go. Now, of course, this is a dangerous way of speaking to people who are in the process, of young people especially, who are still in the process of learning elementary competence in the culture, learning the taboos and the conventions. Because we take their minds off the happening to do that. Well, it isn't necessary to do it that way. It isn't really necessary to turn a child into a moron in the process of becoming an adult, but that's what we do. Because we teach a child to be a child. And that prevents them from growing up. It's a method of keeping them off the labor market. But if you speak to a child from the beginning as if it were an adult, and talk, not baby talk, but straight language, your child will become master of English language, say about three years old, certainly in talking it, and will be able to tell you a lot of funny things you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but then the trouble is you have to send the poor thing to school, <laughs> and uh, where if it is that so advanced, it will be regarded as a freak. Yeah and have a very bad time of it, so it will have to conceal itself as a moron. Sometimes children are brought up without that interruption of being a child. 
uh, you know, with all the cutie pie stuff, and uh, I mean, that's what bores me about Christmas. It's a way of uh, commercializing childhood. You've been listening to Alan Watts in Inevitable Ecstasy Part 1. And now we're going to go on to Part 3 of the seminar. Well, at least part of Part 3. An edit of about 20 minutes where he gets into some very interesting territory. Enjoy Alan Watts in Inevitable Ecstasy, brought to you by the Ram Dass Be Here Now Podcast Network, with some help from Eden Hemp. I was making a basic comparison yesterday between the state of consciousness of a baby and that of a so-called mature adult. Respectively what we would call undifferentiated and differentiated. The adult consciousness being highly selective and the baby consciousness being very open and hardly selective at all, and therefore unable to distinguish what adults consider to be the important things, which have to do with the conventions and rules of a social game based on the positive aspects whether they be called good or pleasant or uh, life-giving and so on, that must prevail over the negative aspects. And I went on to show that this contrast between the two views of the world has another marked characteristic that in the case of the baby who hasn't been trained or told doesn't distinguish between voluntary behavior and involuntary occurrence. And of course we think this is a very fundamental defect. But if we go back, you see, to a principle that underlies the whole universe with a kind of mathematical exactitude, we see that if we reduce things to the situation of primal simplicity and we have a primordial self and other situation that is to say two balls in space there is absolutely no way of telling when they move which one of them is moving or which one is still they must um, necessarily appear to move mutually. There's no point of reference except each other to determine which is moving and which is still. Now, everything that goes on in the universe is simply a complication of that principle. Because the same thing holds true if you multiply the number of balls. You will see that that primordial principle, that all movement is mutual, still applies. And so, in the complexity of things, because we get situations where, say, there is relative stillness and one particular body is moving with relation to that, we think automatically those many bodies are indeed still and that this one body is going this. See? Here's one and here's many. And the one we say, well, is doing this. We don't assume that the many are doing this. Now that's the principle of the majority is always right. (laughs) They constitute the most impressive background. (laughs) The fixed stars as against the planets. But we're always going to get back to that absolutely fundamental situation. And therefore the baby's failure to distinguish between the voluntary and the involuntary, the I and the other, is in a way correct. 
Psychologists, psychoanalysts in particular, make a great deal of this contrast and consider that the baby's view is inferior to the adult's. And if an adult should uh, go to that view or acquire that view, in psychoanalysis this would be called regression. The point that is missed is that the two ways of looking at things need each other to balance out. And that one needs the baby's view as a basis for the adult view, because if you don't have it, you take the adult view too seriously. Get completely carried away by it. All right, now. If we can see the first part, which is that the ego is purely fictitious, that it is a symbol or image of oneself, plus a sensation of muscular strain occasioned by trying to make this symbol an effective agent to control emotion, to concentrate, to direct the nervous operations of the organism. Then immediately it is clear that what we have called ourselves, what we have thought of as ourselves, isn't able to do anything at all. There follows this kind of silence in which there is nothing to do except watch what happens. But what is happening is watching itself. There is nobody apart from it watching it. And so we get into the state of meditation, or as I prefer to call it, contemplation. So then the next problem that arises is, well, what about all the other illusions? Although they are somehow integrated and centered upon the illusion of ego, nevertheless, the whole value system of what is important, what is not important, what is good, what is bad, what is pleasant, what is painful, has to be called in question. Now then, we get to this. As I explained yesterday afternoon, what we are aware of is a complex of vibrations. And we have been conditioned to call them graduatingly good, bad, pleasant, painful. Whereas, as a matter of fact, they are nothing but vibrations. And if you look at any one of them by itself, you won't know where it is. That is to say, if you only know red, you can't see that it's red. You can only know that this is red by contrast with yellow and green and blue and violet. So you don't know that a sound is loud unless you know soft sounds, or you don't know that it's soft unless you know loud. And it is that comparison which gives us the feeling of uh, the spectrum as being varied. Otherwise, we wouldn't know. For example, when you watch television, you are actually seeing a single moving point moving over the screen. But it goes so fast that you see it in all these different places having different values of light. But let us supposing there was someone whose retina was not retentive in this way. He would look at the screen and see the moving point of light and say to human beings, I don't see what you see in this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now, can we, therefore, get back not only to the situation where we see that the ego is a mere construct, but also where we see that all the values we put on 
the vibrations are arbitrary. And that we get to a position where we see the vibrations simply as the vibrations. And we would say then, well, surely all this is nonsense, which is correct. <laughs> the universe, I mean, is a kind of badoodida, 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 and going on in this fantastic way. This is why music can be used as a meditative technique. Because a lot of music is, in, is, is, is nonsense. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. But it can be very interesting. So can you get back again to recollecting from childhood your pleasure in events that from your present point of view you would call entirely meaningless. That you could listen to a sound like a twanging metal and it goes boing, 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 and that's fascinating. Boing. <laughs> it's just boing. And that's, that's all it is. See? Now, if you can really get with boing, you can see the whole universe in boing. Really. Because every vibration that's possible implies all the others. And so, likewise, with the candle flame, with the reflection, with grain in wood, anything can, from this child point of view, be completely fascinating. Not because it means anything, but just for what it is that it is shaped so. Because, obviously, that gives a taste, a quality, to a vibration that is extremely interesting. And it's only if you look very carefully at a vibration that you can see this point. That's why meditative exercises often involve a repetition process. Om, or saying a phrase, or doing an act like a mudra, over and over and over again. After a while, it becomes meaningless. You can say your own name like the Sufis do and go on and on and on and on and on and finally, it, it doesn't mean anything at all. It's just a noise. But it isn't just a noise, you see. The attitude of saying that something is just a noise or just a, a wiggle is an adult attitude. No wiggle to the child is just a wiggle. To the child, the elemental thing going on is blah, you know? I mean, it's just fantastic. <laughs> now, do you see why this is what mystics call ineffable? That is to say, you can't really talk about it. When I try to explain what I mean by digging, a sound. I suddenly realize that I'm not really saying anything. And yet there are states of consciousness in which you can listen to sound and realize that that is the whole point of being alive. Just to go with this particular energy manifestation that is happening right at this moment to be it. The whole world is the energy playing at doing all this 
You see, like a kaleidoscope, jazzing. So if you watch that, and watch it that way, you will be accused, of course, by those who are guardians of the game of doing something very dangerous. But you're going completely crazy. The number of theological texts I've read which express in one way or another this horror of everything becoming meaningless, the meaningless life, a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Those people, you see, have not dared to look at it. Now, there's another way of looking at it, of course, where in states of acute depression, people see it all as meaningless, but not really meaningless. They see it all as a conspiracy of horror. Let's imagine that everything is mechanical. There are no living beings at all. There are a lot of beings that are such good computers that you can't tell the difference between them and what you thought were people. <laughs> but everything going on is simply clockwork. And uh, there's nobody home, although it puts on a convincing show that there is. And so you get the feeling that the entire world is enameled tin or patent leather or plastic and tasteless, hollow, like a Wurlitzer jukebox. <laughs> That's a very common feeling of people who get into acute depression. But you see there is still here a valuation. you are associating the world with the mechanical as distinct from the organic. And we have a tendency, you see, to put down the mechanical because obviously a plastic flower doesn't have the scent, it doesn't have the soft feeling of a living flower. Oh, there will perfume plastic flowers soon. But it, you know what it'll do, it'll smell vaguely like soap and it won't smell like a flower. So it'll be plastic smell. Now we know that, you see, and so we contrast it with the organic. But in what we're doing now, we are getting to a feel of the world that is neither organic nor mechanical. Simply what it is. We don't know the contrast, just as we don't know the contrast voluntary-involuntary, we don't know the contrast organic-mechanical. But neither. You've been listening to Alan Watts in a recording on Inevitable Ecstasy. The tape was made in 1969 aboard the ferry boat Vallejo, tied up at the north end of Sausalito near San Francisco and was one of a number of seminars that he recorded that year. This one toward the end of the year in November. You can find this recording and many others that he made in the 60s and early 70s at the Alan Watts Organization website, which also gives an overview of his written works and life story. I'm Mark Watts. Thank you for listening. And thank you for our sponsor at Eaton Hemp and the help of the Ram Dass Be Here Now podcast network. Eaton makes a line of farm-to-table hemp products from their organic facility in upstate New York. And they've been sending us goodies, peanut butter crunchies, and other things. And I highly recommend their oils and other products as well. <laughs>